Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Today we're continuing in John chapter 1, verse 6. We'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to join us for our study today. If you have joined us on our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat area there to let us know what you think. Give us your comments, your thoughts, your questions. We'd love to hear from you. If you've joined us via Facebook, then just use the comment section on this live video stream. And again, if you have a question or a comment or a thought, let us know. Let's hear from you and we'll be happy to bring you into our study. We have kind of a limited number with us today. I wouldn't say the brightest or the prettiest, but we have us. Um, Paul is unable to be here today. He's got a relative who's undergoing a medical procedure. And um, Brendan has been playing golf too much, so he's got to hurry up and get ready for Sunday. <laughs> it's not the exact truth. He does have a lot to take care of today, he said. And um, who's the other one? Oh, Bob's not feeling well today. So Yeah, dealing with voice issues. Dealing with voice issues. All right, well, hope it gets feeling better, better soon, or uh, better as well. All right, let's see. We have uh, Chris Kramer with us, uh, a.k.a. Truth and Reason. We have Aline Haynes and Jimmy Kersey and others. Let's see, Jerry. Jerry Wilcox is here. And if if you've not uh, dropped us a comment or something, that's fine. We, we still know that you're with us. We just kind of have that, that sense, you know, that we're being watched by the masses. But anyway. But we would love to hear from you. So if you don't mind, if you just want to say hi, tell us where you're from, that would be great as well. So picking up in John chapter 1, there in verse 6, we're getting ready to go into a different section here of this chapter. So we, we, he's introduced the word, how uh, Jesus was with the word. Matter of fact, here in a minute, we'll back up and read verses 1 through 5 just to kind of get us into it. But then we're going to talk about John the baptizer in his role. So, Tom, if you would, let me get this ready. If you would read for us beginning in verse 1, and let's read down to verse 13. A little bit lengthy of a reading, but it gives us a way of reviewing what we looked at last time, and then we'll pull it on, uh, continue with our discussion there. All right. Okay. And, and, and I am reading from the New King James Version. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay. All righty. Let's see. <clears throat> so as we talked about last week, we talked about Jesus and him being the word, being in the beginning. <clears throat> so we pick up there in verse six, John, the apostle now introduces in this narrative, John, the baptizer and <clears throat> pardon me, Tom, what is the significance um, of let me rephrase your question. When you look at the other gospels, do you see a very specific responsibility that John was given? And we see that John came preaching this, preaching that. But in this case in point, what does John the apostle attribute to John the baptizer? What was his role? Well, uh, I mean, he's, uh, John is more specific in, in establishing the fact that he, he was a witness. He came, he came to bear witness as to who Jesus was. You know, you know, bear in mind, if our understanding is correct, John was the last of the Gospels or the, the fourth, the fourth of the four Gospels and so on. And, and, and he, he uh, I, I believe that in his Gospel, he's actually clearing up some things 
you know, in, in many instances, filling in details. And, and, and he basically establishes that John was a witness of whom Jesus was in, in greater detail. And of course, that goes along with the uh, apologetic or the evidentiary nature of the Gospel of John. Okay. And that, I think that's pretty straightforward. You know, most of the, you look at the other Gospels, as you already mentioned, he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. You know, and that's what his role was. But here we see a greater identification, or not a greater, a more focus, like you already pointed out there, as to him being, to, he came to bear witness of the light. But Brian, in verse number eight, though, John sees it necessary, and I understand why, I think, to make a distinct uh, difference between John and Jesus. What are your thoughts on that? You know, the, yeah, the thing about John the Baptist, we cannot emphasize enough how important he is. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus will make this testimony that of, among those born of a woman, there have been none greater than John the Baptist. He is an extraordinarily important person. Very last words of the Old Testament, book of Malachi, are a prophecy about John's coming. Kind of neat then that like, you know, our first words in the New Testament, um, whether it's Mark, <laughs> whether it's, you know, uh, here in John, is introducing us to John the Baptist. Uh, so there's a there's something so important about John. John is so important that there's actually a group even today that follow John the Baptist as the Messiah. They're called the Mandaeans, and uh, they're in the Middle East. And uh, it, it probably is the case since we meet disciples of John the Baptist, uh, even decades after John has died, that John's impact cannot be, um, cannot be emphasized enough. He is tremendously important. But his importance is testified right here when it says that he came to bear witness of the light. That is John's ultimate purpose as testimony. Um, we've said this last week. One of the things about the book of John is there's a great emphasis on the idea, like in a courtroom, of witness and testimony. The word witness is used, I think, about 20 times in the book of John. The word testimony or testify is used about 20 times in the book of John. Um, John is going to break out seven different testimonies um, th about Jesus. And the very first one is John the Baptist. He'll go on. He'll say... Um, Jesus' works, his miracles testify of him. The Old Testament testifies of him. The apostles are going to testify of him. And then Jesus says that the Father testifies him, the Holy Spirit testifies of him, and he testifies of himself. Seven testimonies uh, that the book of John are going to relate to us. And the very first one, John the Baptist, is tremendously important. John, uh, John's whole purpose, and by the way, we're going to get this a little further in the chapter. John came baptizing so that he might identify the Messiah and reveal him to men. So uh, again, here is a prophet. I mean, we don't have other prophets that are prophesied about. You know, John is prophesied about, I, I mentioned Malachi, but he's also prophesied about in Isaiah. That's how important he is. And his whole purpose is summed up right here to bear witness of the light. You know, it's interesting that at least in, in this particular, um, the publisher of the New King James Version, earlier, and we'll come back to what Brian was talking about there, make the connection here. Earlier in the text, he says that in verse four, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness, darkness did not comprehend it. It's interesting that here in verse number seven, Brian, they actually capitalized the term light, the word light. Not sure why they would do that, if not doing it earlier, but, he really makes a, a, a distinct point that, and going back to what you're talking about, the Mandaeans, I believe it was, John wasn't the light. You know, he, he, he makes this very clear that he, that is John, this man who came for a witness was not that light. But instead, as you already pointed out, he came to bear witness of the light and to bear witness of that. But what makes this interesting is that there in verse number nine, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. When John was doing this declaration, when he was preaching about Jesus, he was preaching about Jesus before Jesus ever died upon the cross. And you think about it, how long would John's service as a witness continue? Short time. Maybe a year? That's, I'm, I'm guessing. that's very interesting. That's a very interesting point. In John chapter 3, John's going to tell us, now I'm diminishing. You know, John right. will make yeah. this testimony. <clears throat> I'm done. I've done what my job was. 
what what a guy by the way that can say my job's over you know i'm he's not even what 33 i mean he's in his early 30s at this point he's only six months older than jesus um and he's he's acknowledging my life's over you know i've yeah. done what i needed to do what a guy i mean he's incredible yeah yeah yeah, and, yeah and, and in doing that he knew that he needed to get out of the way you know, I, oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you know, you you wonder about the death of John, and you know, people talk about the cruelty, the cruelty associated with that. Uh, but yeah. but you know what? I mean, uh, John has received his reward, and we have we have zero doubts <laughs> about what John's reward is. So I mean, he he finished his work, and he he had to be moved out of the way because people were worshiping him. Or you yeah. know, following after him. So I mean, it had to happen. Imagine what it would have been if he would have continued. Yeah. Uh, Bob makes a point in the um, in the chat room on the Facebook side. The light refers to Jesus, therefore capitalized. I understand and I agree with that. But I wondered why he was why the term light wasn't capitalized back in verses four and five. Well, just, yeah, I just find it interesting, you know. Yeah, well, you know, but but when I look at that, uh, the way it's used in verses four and five is it's describing what he did. It's not identifying him mm, as like a well, as a pronoun yeah. or a yeah, yeah, uh, noun, yeah. Sorry. And him was the life. The life was the light of men. So yeah, he's but... just describing. He was describing what he did there. Whereas in verse number seven, the light is identifying him. Yeah, that may be. That may be. And the life was the light of men and the light shined in the darkness. And then we yeah. come down to verse number nine. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Yeah. So I see yeah. a point. I, and I think that's the point Bob was making too. The fact that in verse nine, the publishers make the distinction between that was the true light. Let me bring it back up here, which gives light, lower case, every man coming into the world. Um, the, the, the New King James Version really tries at times, like the term spirit in Romans chapter 8, to capitalize when they think it's referring to deity. The only problem is they don't always get it. I don't think they get it right all the time. You know, they'll capitalize right, yeah, it's judgment. When it's not intended. shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, it, it's judgment. I mean, when you go, yeah. you know, we've probably talked about this, but when you go back to the original manuscripts, mm -hmm. you know, you know, people are aware. I mean, I mean, you look at the actual original manuscripts, which we don't have. But even the earliest copies, which did the same thing as the original manuscripts, all Greek capital letters, no spaces in between, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it's just it's later on when those spaces come along and you've got the capital and those lower, the upper and lowercase letters. Uh, and, and by the way, that's one of the ways that we date. That's one of the ways that we date documents is, is based upon the form of the letters, whether it's all capitals, whether it's where yeah. spaces are and so on. But, but, but in our case, there's a matter of judgment associated with that. Yeah. Well, like if you look at different translations, like yeah. probably I haven't checked it, like the ESV or the New American Standard Bible, they don't always capitalize even, even the, right. the pronouns like he, right. Yeah. You know, they don't yeah. they always do that. And they choose not to. I mean, yeah. and, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and again, you know, I mean, it, it's a matter of it's a matter of translation and what your focus is as you translate. Yeah. Years ago, when we were in McAllister, Oklahoma, I think it was, I would I remember having it's just a vague memory, but I remember having a dinner or lunch with some preachers that were in the area, came through visiting, meeting, whatever. And the discussion came up about writers who insist on capitalizing like he and his. And I've had one of those, if I'm gonna write an article and I'm refer to Jesus or God, I'll capitalize the pronouns. But there were some of them who just felt like that was unnecessary to do that. But that's, that's a different discussion. That's more writing styles and things like that. But it was interesting. Brian, from your comment, I get the suspicion there's a verse you'd like to cross-reference at this time. Yeah. So, you know, there's the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John. And one of them is, uh -huh. I am the light. I am the light of the world. Um, and I was just looking it up. Light is mentioned about, talked about about 20 times in the book of John. It's kind of a neat uh, little reference there, too, that this idea of Jesus being the light of the world, um, everything we're going to know about God is going to be because of Jesus. That's a theme that you get a couple of times. He'll say, you know the Father if you know me. 
that's also true of the Holy Spirit, because we'll know the Holy Spirit because Jesus uh, is going to to reveal this and send him. That's a big theme later in the book of John. Uh, he's going to send him to reveal all things to us. So uh, it's just really neat that we're we're touching on this light theme right away. There's, there's a lot we could say about it uh, for the sake of time. You know, we'll just say, remember, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. Um, and you think of all the marvelous things light does. That it, uh, you know, that it, that it, what it does to darkness. Hebrews chapter one and verse one and two, where it talks about, you know, today God speaks through His Son Jesus. That's light of the world kind of thought. Yeah, good point. Right. Good point. Yeah. yeah, and He gives sight to a blind man to prove it. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, and and Bob Bob makes a comment, just kind of, just kind of driving home the difference between Jesus and John, as as John distinctly states here, but. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. Bob says, as great as John was, so much John the baptizer, not one drop of his blood went toward the purchase of the Lord's church. And that's the problem with having a religious group that holds, upholds John the baptizer as like the Messiah. Yeah, good point. Good point, Bob. All right, any other thoughts on this through verse nine before, here we're gonna get back now to discussing Jesus, the light, the world, or the word, I mean. Any thoughts? So bringing this on down into verse number 10, I, now, am I safe to say, y'all tell me, that when he says he was in the world, he's no longer talking about John the baptizer, but now based on context, he's switching back to Jesus, isn't he? Absolutely, yeah. verses nine yeah. through 11, ver, ver, verse nine, yeah, you know. Uh, that was John yeah. versus well, Jesus, well, yeah, or. yeah. Yeah, Jesus well, was I mean, the true light. Verse yeah. nine, yeah, that was the true light, which yeah. gives light to every man. So he's John, the writer. <laughs> you know, got to clarify. You know, I mean, John the writer in verses nine through eleven, he's dealing with Jesus, whom yeah. whom John the Baptist introduced. Should yeah. we do like uh, J? I was going to say J W for John the writer and J B for John the baptizer, but I don't know if that might be a bit more confusing. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. All right, uh, let's see. One more thought on the the, the the cap the caps situation there, coming in from Caleb. It's a respect thing, and I, I agree with that, personally speaking. The capital, uh, he has been around for a long time, even before we had lowercase and uppercase letters. Good point, good point there. All right, so now let's look at verse 10 again. In this particular, um, Here's what he says, that he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Now, I think that's a very interesting point there, Tom, that the last statement in verse number 10 kind of sets up for the next three verses following when he says that well, although he made the world, the world did not know him. Um, any, any thoughts about where John is going with this? Yeah, I, I, I actually think he, <laughs> you talk about the next three verses, uh, directly, but uh, he's setting up the gospel. I mean, I mean, why was Jesus rejected? Because the world did not know him. You know, I I've preached a sermon, and it was by no means original. Um, but I preached a sermon actually probably a couple of times entitled "Who Crucified Jesus," and uh, and you know, I mean, the bottom line is everybody did. But 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 when you go back to the first century, the the Jews were responsible for it. The Romans were responsible for it. Uh, um, and you could just go on down the list. Pilate was responsible. Uh, and all those who crucified Jesus did it because they didn't know him. And, and it's not that they didn't recognize him as a person. It's they didn't know who he was. They did not know that he was the light. They did not acknowledge that he was the light. And, and, and I think the greatest of the sins falls on the Jews for that because they had the word, uh, uh, they had the old law, they ought to have known better. And and they just deliberately chose not to. So so clearly the idea of the world did not know him, you know, the idea of that is rejecting, uh, yeah. uh, that, that they rejected Jesus, bottom line. That's a good point, good point there. And that's pretty much where he goes through with verses 11, 12, and 13. Um, apologies, I forgot to silence my phone earlier. Okay. And, and you know, it's also kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. At least in verse 10, 
the word world is used in at least two different senses there. I don't know, maybe you could even do it in three different senses. You know, you've got the idea of he was in the world, uh, and the world was made through him. I, I guess you could tie those two together as talking about the physical world mm -hmm. itself. But then he goes on, and the world did not know him. That's not talking about the physical sphere. It's talking about the people of the world. So so you've got the play on words or or the different usages of word. That uh, is interesting. World, and it's the uh, same the Greek world. word each time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and don't you find it fascinating, I, I know I do, that in our English language, why is it that sometimes the same word that has different meanings in our language are the exact same different meanings in the Greek. <laughs> you know, going back to the original, I mean, the word world means both things to us the same way that it means meant both things as John was writing this. Hmm. Yeah. Same thing with spirit, you know, which, which is even more, I guess, uh, conflated or whatever the word is, you know, uh, the usages. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other thoughts or comments about verse number 12 and 13? And, and, of course, let me bring it back up here real quick. He does say, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So two, two active things being seen there, as many as received him, those who believe in his name. That's the same thing, effectively. You receive right. him, you receive his teachings, and therefore, as a result, you believe in him. Um, right. uh, who were born know, John, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out in this verse that this is, this is the first uh, introduction to the idea of what's involved in obeying the gospel or be, or or being saved, yeah. and um, it, it's important to hone in on those, these verses because this is where for lack of a better term, many in the denominational world or the religious world miss the point. You know, you know when they talk about how do you receive him and, and those types of things, you know, we've, we've got to understand that there are many times the word, like I think in this case, the word received and the word believe that is used in this word or in this verse Mm -hmm. isn't talking about simply the idea of acknowledging that he is there or admitting that he lived or even admitting who he was associated with that word believe is the you know man's part you know man's part in obeying the gospel uh the response that comes because of your belief and i think it's significant to understand that because John is a gospel that all throughout, he's going to be using the term believe. And it has reference to, yeah, they believed him. And it wasn't just a mental acknowledgement. It was a response that did what he told them to do. And that, that's the ultimate point. So, so just bear that in mind as you go through the gospel of John. Um, and, and this is borne out in the rest of the New Testament. It's, it's borne out in so many places where he emphasizes uh, believing in me also involves doing what I say. You know, uh, Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So, And you could just go on from there. Think Luke 8. You know, wh why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do not do the things that I say. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, you know, a, a good illustration, if we're going to talk about um, people receiving Jesus, go back and look in, what is it, uh, Matthew 10, 11, and 12. And he talks about those cities that did not receive him. Bethsaida, Chorazin, and who's the other one? There was like three cities. Capernaum, was it? There were three cities he mentioned who did not Chorazin. receive him. Chorazin. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And... Um, in those cases, they literally did not receive him. They right. saw the miracles that was that was done. Pardon me. They did not receive him. And so it, you're right. It's much more than simply acknowledging or professing some belief. It's much more than that. It's a, you know, and we see physical examples of that. I guess help right. to illustrate this. Yeah. Right. 
Exactly. And, and of course, that's the point that's driven home in James. Of course. James chapter 2, where he's talking about faith and works. I mean, uh, 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 the the fact is, is where salvation is concerned is you you absolutely cannot separate them, you know, when it comes to being what God wants you to be. By the way, I mentioned Luke 8. It's Luke 6, Luke 6, 46 that said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? I just wanted to clarify the verse. That's a good point, though. Yeah. Um, From the Facebook side of the world, Bob says... um, Verses 10 to 11 refer to Jesus' ministry. They rejected him by putting him on the cross. Many of his own did receive him after his resurrection. And that's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. So now here is, if there were, if there's any doubt in anyone's mind who the word was, John tells us in verse 14. You know, at least, you know, obviously the statements about John the baptizer should have already been a big hint as to the word, who was, who is the word. But beginning of verse number 14, we're going to look into that a little more closely. So, Brian, if you would read for us verses 14 down through 18, I think would probably be a good stopping point there. Okay. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay. Interesting, or I say interesting point. What kind of seemed interesting to me, interesting to me as we read through this here. And we can talk about verse 14 here in just a second. I think that's very significant. But look at verse number 15 there. When he says that um, John cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is prefer- preferred before me, for he was before me. So without a doubt, this tells us that John believed that Jesus was from heaven, that he was the Messiah, he was sent from the Father, that he didn't simply begin his existence six months after John began his existence, if you would. Yeah. Um, the Brian, any thoughts about verse number 14? We come into that. Well, I want to say that one of the things that we're getting a heavy hit on in these first 18 verses is that Jesus is God. Um, Of course, verse one was pretty obvious, but then we have that statement that he created all things. That's a God statement. Um, This term, though, that he uses twice in our reading here, and of course, we're more familiar with it in John 3, 16 and 18, the only begotten son. um, That's a really special word because only begotten is one word in Greek, and it's this word monogenes, which means the one of the nature, you know, this idea of, you know, like genetics, you know, the, uh, is the word genus, uh, monogenus. And the idea is this is the one son God has that shares his nature. Well, if, you know, if I have a biological son, he shares my nature. I'm human. He's human. I, I'm dashingly handsome. I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, you know, the point is he shares my nature. He, he and I have the same nature. The only begotten son has the same nature of the father. Later in John, we're going to see them try to kill Jesus whenever he says, God is my father. And they're going to say, you know, by making God your father, you're saying you're equal to God. Yes, he is. That's the that's the thing. And John has hit it, what, six times now here in these first 18 verses that, you know, by trying to make it clear, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus, you know, Jesus is God. Jesus is, you know, the creator of all things. Jesus is the son that shares the nature of God being God. So, so... Well, oftentimes people say that is the that is the theme in which John tells us about Jesus throughout the whole book, that Jesus is God. In John chapter 20, in his, I wrote this book so you'll know, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God, in other words. That's yeah. that's the big idea. So that's one thing I like to grab out of all of this, is that we just keep coming back to the same idea. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And uh, that's, that's going to be a big idea throughout the rest of us. John is testifying Jesus is God. He existed apart from his existence on earth. Well, that's not an angel. You know, that's God. So 
you know, it's, it's a testimony of John. Okay. Good explanation. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, kind of summarizing the phrase, we beheld the, his glory, you know, as of the only begotten of the father. Yeah. And, and it's, and, and the glory is of the, the begotten of the father, you know? So in other words, yeah. Jesus will later say in John um, uh, 14, uh, you know, that if you've seen me, you've seen the father, you know, that's, that's this connection, you know, this, this idea that, do you want to know who God is? If you know who Jesus is, you know who God is. Why? Well, Jesus is God, but also the, the, the father is manifested through Jesus. So, you know, you, we don't, we'll never, he'll say this, uh, uh in verse, uh, uh, just a little further on, nobody sees the father, you know, God, the father, except mm -hmm. the son. And what's neat about the book of John is that we won't see the father. We'll hear the Father because John will record one of the three times the Father speaks, but we'll never see the Father. And that's just such a important idea. We, you know, how is the Father manifested? Through the Son. The Son is yeah. manifested through the flesh and the Spirit, another story, another time, but we'll actually find in John chapter 6, the Spirit is manifested by the words of Jesus or the Scriptures. Okay. Do you think it's safe to say... And Tom, you weigh in on this too, that we, we look at the apostles. They were sent out by Jesus, ambassadors sent out by Jesus. And so Jesus says, if you know, effectively, if people don't receive you, they don't receive me, and vice versa. But would it be safe to say, though, that God sending Jesus and, and, and they're looking at Jesus, he was much more than simply a representative, an ambassador of God. He was God. You know, oh, that's and clearly, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, uh, go, go to the Sermon on the Mount. At, at the very conclusion of the mm -hmm. Sermon on the Mount, yeah, they were astonished because he spoke not as the leaders, but as one. He spoke with authority. Yeah, that's uh, right. I mean, uh, you have heard that it was said, but yeah. I say, yeah. I mean, I, I mean that that's just so clearly established. That that he he was far above, and and he gets into more of that in the Gospel of John, yeah. uh, which incidentally, isn't that what gets him in the, the most trouble? <laughs> you know, I, I I mean, with the religious leaders, that's what gets yeah. him into trouble. Is the bold declaration? I mean, before Abraham was, I am, and, yeah. and they're picking up stones. You know, I mean, they knew exactly what he meant. Uh, when he made that declaration and and had it not been true they would have had a right to stone him according to the law yeah, but uh but right. their blindness caused them to not even consider it that's right yeah maybe a better you example know, would be think about the difference between elijah and jesus elijah right. was simply a prophet spokesperson for god even though carried by inspiration the message of god but jesus was so much more i'm sorry yeah, brian go ahead no, and what Tom said got me really excited um, that, uh, you know, the thing that they're going to do, uh, John, uh, Tom pointed out at the end of the at, at the end of the, the Sermon on the Mount, they say, who is this to conquer with authority? Think of the other times where they say that, too. And, and in one of the miracles John is going to talk about is one of those times where Jesus controls the weather. Jesus doesn't say, Father, would you God, would you stop this weather? He doesn't pray like Elijah does because right. Elijah has a nature like ours. Jesus says, weather, stop. And what do they always say? Well, in Mark, they say, who is this that has the power to control? Well, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's the same statement as who could speak with this kind of authority in Matthew. Uh, they say, you're the son of God. Um, that miracle of this, I stand up and I, or Jesus stands up and Jesus tells the weather what to do. That's a, I created the weather kind of person. So yeah. it's really you know, remarkable that they're they're going to have these moments of, you know, this could only be one person, you know, and, um, you know, anybody who can deny that Jesus is God, uh, it's it, it, how can you deny it whenever that's what everybody's talking about in the in the four accounts of his life? They're, they're keep talking about who could do this, but God, who could who could be this, but God, who could forgive sins, but God, who could, you know, who, who could tell the weather what to do, but God. Uh, who could tell us what the law is? Not 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 interpret it or give us his opinion on it. Who could say, "Here's the law. Here's what I say." But God, and it's pretty uh, pretty impressive. It's yeah, and, and isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that uh, it was the leaders who didn't get it? 
<laughs> you know, and, 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 and by the way, you know, tying that into the text that we're talking about right now, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Right here at the beginning, John's making the contrast and he's bringing in the fact that the law whom these leaders followed, you know, he makes the point that you receive the law through Moses. But Jesus is coming along with something better, grace and truth, truth. You know, that's it. You know, was the law of Moses truth? You know, you know, I, I mean, as far as the Jews were concerned, yes, it was. But it wasn't the ultimate end of uh, it, it was the ultimate end that God had in mind. You know, yeah. it was our tutor. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians right. chapter 3, that we dealt with. So, I mean, right here in verse 17, he introduces the law of Moses and contrasts the law of Moses with what Jesus came to do. Um, we have one comment to bring in, um, and I think it's a good, in, in context of what we're talking about, Jesus being much more than Elijah, people seeing him, seeing the Lord, seeing God, John 14 uh, verse 9, and, and I'm going to start reading from verse 8 there, John 14. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Then verse 11, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So good cross-reference. Appreciate that. Yeah. I want to add on top of that, just a few verses later in John 14, 17, Jesus will say that we can only know the spirit of truth through Jesus as well. That, uh, you know, not quite as directly, but he says the spirit of truth, the world can't see I'm going to sin under my authority. Um, you know, he's going to be with you. So, and then of course he's going to define the spirit of truth as the 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 living word of God, John 17, 17. Truth is uh truth is going to mention about 20 times in the book of John um as one of those ideas that really is big. Um, you know, and we've already seen it twice now here in our reading so far. Good point. Good point. All right, any other thoughts? How about from you at home? You got anything on your mind right now? An idea that's come to you about what we're looking at? We'd love to hear from you. Let's take just a moment and remind you how you can contact us. If maybe you've got a thought or a question you'd like to send us later, you can send all emails to questions at truthfactor.com. Emails at questions at truthfactorlive.com. I guess they both would work, but for the sake of Truth Factor Live, use that one right there. Um, but you can also individually email us and you'll see them there on the screen. John, Paul, Tom, Brian, Brendan, Bob, etc at truthfactor.com and they will receive we will receive your your messages love to hear from you and love to have your questions as well we'd like to talk about those and and um it helps to expand our understanding that reminds me of something that was stated last week after our study when the three of us we talked about, about this last week when we get together study we enjoy studying together whether it's three of us or the six of us or whatever as individuals, uh, individual preachers and so forth. But when you join us and you have your comments and so forth, you also bring um, something of great value to our study. There's been a lot of times that someone in the comments will make a statement about something that hasn't really occurred to us or in a course of that study, we just didn't really think about it. And it helps to expand our understanding as well. So we are all here figuratively, literally, I guess, digitally. <laughs> helping one another and studying the word of God together. So maybe that's the term fit literally digitally. I have a question I'm going to throw out here. I'm going to throw it at Tom, but I'll throw it to anyone. Tom, Tom read that passage a moment ago and he pulled our attention to verse 17. Um, I hear a lot of denominational preachers say that there is no law in Christ, that law was through Moses. Jesus is all about grace. There is no law in Jesus Christ. Tom, how do you answer that whenever that comes up? Uh, Jesus fulfilled the law. Uh, I, I mean, you know, he, he, he fulfilled the law of Moses from that standpoint. But then again, when, when the point is being made there, his, it, he's clearly 
identifying what law that he's talking about. I mean, you can't you can't go through the teachings of Jesus and not see law. Uh, uh, let me take you back to the let me take you back to the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And when he makes that declaration, he gives them instructions. No, I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, so so Jesus is not dismissing law. He's just pointing out that the old law was was fulfilled, which incidentally was the main point that I think he was driving at in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he gets to it early on after he talks about. Uh, uh, yeah, after example, you know, ver verse, verses 13 through 16 of Matthew 5, your salt and your light. And and then he then he goes, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. So so Jesus never, you know, Jesus never says law is not important. Uh, Jesus never said the law of Moses was not important. You know, I mean, uh, that's the point to consider, but yet he has come to bring a new law, and it is it is a law based on grace, and and, and we need to be grateful about that because uh, the law of grace isn't about we don't have anything to do, and what we do is not important. But just be thankful that when you sin, you don't have to go get a bull and take it to Jerusalem and have it sacrificed you know and and just go down the list just go down the list of what they had to do under the old law so that's that's the idea of the grace uh, i don't need a priest to intercede on my behalf i can go directly through my high priest who is jesus and so you just go on down the list so that that, that would be uh the uh, uh, impulse answer you know I, I if i thought about it i might add some more to it but I, I really like you going to the sermon on the mount which was you know here's moses's law here's my law um and and of course like i said look at all the times we have statements about the law of christ in the new testament uh you know we're we're told repeatedly things about the law of christ that's there and i think what you said is 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 a great way of putting it you know, Moses brought law, Jesus brings law, but what Jesus brings that Moses didn't bring is grace. Um, you know, and I love what you said about the law of Moses, that if you sinned, what do you do? Well, you got to go get a cow, you got to, you know, you got to take it to the priest, you got to get it. But that doesn't even really take away your sin. The Hebrew writer says blood and bulls and goats doesn't really take away sin. All it does is kind of cover it up, you know, but it's still there. It's like putting a rug over a stain in the carpet. You know, you're, you're just covering it up. You're just hiding it. It's not it's not taken away. Grace, the true taking away of sin, is only manifested in the covenant of Christ. Now, I always like to talk about a covenant here because I like to say a covenant is is law and a promise. So the, the covenant of Moses, the law of Moses, and the promised land. But the covenant of Christ, the law of Christ, and grace is the reward. And, and that, that brings us to eternal life. So it's, it's really neat because, you know, I, I hear it all the time with denominational speakers that say, look, here it is. There's no law in Christ. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, there's too many times, and you said it, there's too many times where Jesus is giving commandments. Jesus is going to say in the book of John repeatedly, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Um, but, the, but the idea is that grace wasn't something that was... Uh, the truest grace, the and uh, the word true, grace and truth, there's no, you know, true grace would be another way of rendering that expression. True grace is only through Jesus Christ. It, it didn't exist under the law of Moses. So that's that's what's so neat about what you said. Right. You know, uh, every once in a while, I assume we do, we sing Amazing Grace. You know, uh, wrap in your mind how amazing the grace of God really is. I mean, you know, I mean, that that's not a topic. That's not a topic that you can cover in a couple of sentences. Uh, matter of fact, that's not a topic that you can adequately address in a couple of sermons. I mean, I mean, it really is deep. But but the point is, is just to think about the word amazing. I mean that, that's what's great. That's what's great about that song, and of course that's one of those songs that has a has a story behind it that 
the story establishes the impact of what was meant by the writer. I mean, he was he was a slave trader. You know, he was a slave trader and he was converted. Uh, and uh, that's what you're dealing with there. So, so grace, Jesus is grace, as opposed to the, the letter of the law of Moses. All right, um, real quick here, before we run out of time, uh, two, two things real quick. Um, good, good comments. The only thing that I have to add to that, Brian, going back to the question that you asked, is an answer as to how or maybe why would be a better way of putting it, is the Hebrew writer's explanation in chapters 8 and 9. The blood and bulls and goats could not take away our sins. So that's why the law of Moses was replaced with the grace and truth of Christ. He came to take away our sins. Blood of bulls and goats could never do that. Um, but everything else she said, I agree with completely too. I mean, all that, it's like a big old long discussion, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bob brings in a comment. Yeah, he, Bob he, says, um, he comes from James yeah. 1, 25. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and it's another that. it's another law of Christ passage. Yeah, 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 where he says, um, "But he who looks to the perfect law of liberty continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does." Yeah, yeah, Good and point. James will come back in the second chapter and talk about the the royal law, um, and I like that royal law expression because Moses's law cannot be royal because Moses was not a king, so the royal law yeah. can only be. Jesus's law. So it's a, it's a great passage there. Uh, it's a great passage there. Bob. Yep. Appreciate that, Bob. All right. We are almost, we got a few minutes remaining, but I'll need, I'll need to stop about 12 top, you know, short of a full hour for the study, but because Brian made us late today. Um, I'm going to blame Brian this week, Tom next week. If Paul's here, we'll throw it at him and finally we'll come around to my fault. So, you know, what, John, I, frank, I frankly feel we should blame people that aren't here. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't we just blame Paul and you know, we waited for Bob, Bob and finally had to start. Bob is in the audience, you know. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. to respond, but I, I feel that's that's appropriate. Yeah. Hey, we're preachers; we know how to shift the blame. Preaching one hundred and two. Um, I'm kidding. Please don't take that seriously. <laughs> um, when we get into the next section here, we're going to go back and look at John some more. John's role as witness um, to teach people about the Christ. And um, let's see. All right, let me go take care of something real quick here that's happening locally. Um, I tell you what, let's go ahead and kind of wind this up. I'll be back in just a minute. Brian, if you want to say a few words and then throw it off Tom and then I'll be right back and we'll, we'll close it up real quick here. Yeah. You know, like I said, we've talked about such important ideas here and these are going to be ideas that are, are going to be themes throughout the rest of the book. Uh, truth. Um, you, you know, most of us remember Pilate asking what is truth when Jesus says, I've come to testify the truth. Um, so there's just a lot of little things here that are going to be really important that uh, become themes uh, of where we're going with this. Um, you know, the, 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 of course, the big thing we're about to start into is this testimony of John. What does John the Baptist have to say about Jesus? And that's going to be the rest of this first chapter, or not the rest of the chapter, but a big chunk of the chapter is John's telling this uh, testimony of who he is and then who Jesus is. And what's really neat is that John's going to tell us a few things. Um, I'm going to get my John's right. John the writer is going to reveal some things John the Baptist said that we didn't know from the other gospel accounts, uh, the other uh, accounts of the life of Christ, some of the things about why he was baptizing and what what that was about as well. Um, Tom, uh, I know the camera's going to be stuck on me for a second, but do you have anything you want to throw out there? I'll, you know, I'll, and I'll move my lips with you. That looks like I'm saying it. So. Uh, yeah, you don't need to do that. But <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, verses one through eighteen. Uh, this is the introduction. Uh, th this is the introduction to the letter of John, you know, I, you know, whenever I teach a book, I like to do an introductory lesson, you know, um, verses one through 18 is introducing this book. And so, and we're just going to go from there. And, and by the way, John fixed it so that it did bounce over to me. So. 
Well, that's excellent. Um, well, I know this is kind of bringing us to a close in our time. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it sounds like John has grandchildren um, uh, things going on. So that's kind of a that's a wonderful thing to have to deal with there at the moment. So we're grateful for that. But as we kind of wrap up here and finish our time, uh, I'll turn it back to John and let him uh, finish us up. Well, listen, I appreciate your final words, I still could hear you in my ear as I had to deal with a few things here real quick. Um, but I really appreciate um, Brian and Tom being with us today. We miss Paul, Bob, and Brendan. Hopefully they'll be able to be back next week. Um, but we'd like to thank you for joining us for our study through the Gospel of John. And we'll continue our study next week. Pick up there in verse number 19 of John chapter 1. And we'll continue this wonderful gospel and this wonderful record of the life of Christ given to help strengthen our faith. All right. Well, appreciate it, everyone. And we'll see you here next Thursday, Lord willing, at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. Everyone have a wonderful week.